Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sardar Mohammad Mas. I'm a volunteer of IET on campus NAD Karachi, and I will be your host today. On behalf of IET on campus NAD, I would like to warmly welcome you all to this webinar. First of all, thank, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, and I hope that all of you are doing well. The Institution of Engineering and Technology, commonly known as IET, is an international society working to engineer a better world by inspiring, informing, and influencing the global engineering community. Now, moving forward, I would like to introduce our respected speaker for today's session, Dr. Smile Adam Isagji, who is a senior electrical engineer with more than 15 years of experience under his belt. He is currently working at the electricity utility company in Mauritius. He has been awarded with PhD in Renewable Energy Integration by University of Mauritius, and he has also been recognized with Asia's Best Coaching and Development Leadership Award 2020-2021. Now, before the session starts, I would like to request all the participants to keep their microphones muted during the session. You can type your queries in the chat box. Uh, sir, you may start now. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, thank you for those who came in earlier. So we had a small issue and people are definitely going to join us in the meantime. So thank you for being there for, for maybe devoting part of your time to your development. So let's get started. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be the pros and cons of integrating distributed generation in the power system. Okay, as you may know, all around the world, we are trying to, to get in like renewable energy, like PV, wind, and different types of renewable energy in the power grid. Why, how, what are the consequences? At times we know, at times we don't know. It may be done by tri trial and error. So let's see how, based on what I've been doing in terms of research and what I've been able to collect from different sources, different authors as well, let's see what other impacts. So it definitely can be positive and, and negative. You can, you can maybe, uh, if you are going to have questions, you can put that in the chat box. And later on, maybe at the end of this presentation, we can have a look at that. Okay, so my introduction has been done. This is my contact details. You may reach out to me on my email address. Okay, and uh, we can have a chat if you want to, to, to learn more, okay, to go deeper into what we are going to discuss today. We can definitely do that. I've tried to, to keep the presentation Technical, yes, but not into the details like uh, formula calculations and so on. We're just going to have a look at concepts, things which are like easy to understand even for someone who is not directly related to the field of engineering or electrical engineering. They will be able to, to understand what, what are the issues and so on. Hopefully it's going to be interesting for you because it is one of my fields of, of predilection where I like the most. So a few ground rules. Okay, every prospect will be on mute definitely, so as we can have a good flow of information. You can ask questions in the chat box, this has been said. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you. So just in case if you're missing part of it, just know that it's going to be made available to you later on. It may happen, we are having like it's live, we are from different countries, maybe across the world as well. So uh, just try to, if, if at any point in time, it can be on my side, it can be on your side, if we lose connection, just know that it's going to be reconnected automatically within maybe a few seconds. So don't worry. It happens we are in a live environment. Okay, so what do we have on our menu for today? Are you ready for that? So we are going to understand, we talk about the term distributed generation. What does that mean? Okay, we're going to have a look at the definition, what comes under the banner of distributed generation and what, what not. Then we're going to see the drivers. Why do we need, we, we, are, we not, are we not happy with the conventional way we were producing electricity so many years, 60, 100 years back, we have been producing electricity the same way. Why do we need to change? What is happening to make us change? So these are the drivers forcing us to come up with change. Then we are going to see a few of the, maybe more like we are going to focus on four main things which like affect what we call the network, the, the power system. One is voltage regulation. Second one is TND losses, transmission and distribution losses. We're going to have a look at protection and sense stability of the network, how this can be affected by renewable energy or distributed generation connected to the grid. Then we are going to have a short look at harmonics. 
before coming up with a conclusion, summarizing all what we have discussed today. So first of all, let's have a look at the drivers. Why are we like 10 years back, maybe since 10 years back, there has been a forceful attempt, okay? Even like compelling move to bring renewable energy in the grid. Okay, why? There has been PV forms, PV was already invented. It's not a new invention as such. Okay, but why has it been so much like people are pressing there's a need to forcefully add renewable energy in the, in the grid? Let's have a look. So first of all, we have issues with climatic change. Okay, we have what we have so much of greenhouse gases, which has already been like emitted from cars, from, from uh, maybe uh, sources of electrical power that we have like uh, for the burning of fossil fuel, okay, from centralized power plant. We have CFC, which have been banned in nearly most countries. So all these have already contributed to a lot of CO2, like usually CO2, and oxygen should be like in a balance in the atmosphere. But with time, okay, may, maybe unplanned development, what has happened is that there has been like an extra amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It has gone to depletion of, of, of ozone layer and so on. But what can we do now? So we need to try to reverse this process, okay? So CO2 is at 407 parts per million in October 2018. So it has increased by 90 ppm, nearly 25% in the last 70 years due to industrialization and the different development coming across the globe. So this has led to global warming. So the, 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 the atmosphere, the sea is heating up by much but 1.1 degrees C in the past 200. But what is 1.1 degrees C? That's quite low, isn't it? No, the impact is high in terms of the, the animals living maybe in the sea, in terms of the climatic change. You can see nowadays we are talking about super cyclone, El Nino phenomenon and so on. So it's going to be worse and worse with us if we don't take necessary action right now. We had what we call ocean acidification. So it's maybe, in terms of pH of the ocean, just changing slightly. Maybe we can't feel it, but it's going to affect the plants, the animals there living in the sea. And there's the concept of like melting of glaciers, okay, the iceberg and so on melting. This is going to result in the rising of sea level at a rate of 3.2 millimeter. So what is 3.2? I don't have a ruler right now. It's quite low, but 3.2, what does that mean? But over time, so each year, when you add that cumulatively, it's going to be high. We Mauritius, we are like a, in a, an island, small country in the Indian Ocean, and it's going to affect, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we are among the top 20 countries across the world which are going to be directly affected, okay, by rising sea level. So that's why we need to be very cautious. It's going to affect us, it's going to affect different countries. Countries like Maldives, okay, they may even submerge, be submerged at one point in time. So this is why, like we are now conscious that there's need to do something to address such issues, okay? Maybe to stabilize it first, no more like uh, increase in temperature, in ocean acidification, in CO2 emitted in the atmosphere, then we can try to look for ways by which we can backpedal and maybe take us back in time, okay? So one of these, maybe you know, one, one of the most maybe polluting, uh, maybe component that we have is fossil fuel. So we hate to say that only fossils, that all people like fossil fuel. So there is need to move uh, maybe from fossil fuel to more like healthy or not healthy, but maybe pure, okay, clean energy for, for our maybe transportation sector, as well as for our energy like electricity usage. Yes, so we have so many people looking for uh, maybe greener energies and so on, but then let's have a look at how the uh, consumption across the world, the power distributed is, is focused. Still nowadays with all the, what different countries have been using, all the amount of forces that we have for PV, for uh, maybe solar, for, for so solar you have different, you have PV, you have concentrated solar, different types. And then you have maybe wind, geotechnical, uh, a geothermal power plant and so on. All these are renewables. People are forcing all that into the uh, power system, but still we have around 80% of our 
energy consumption coming from fossil fuel, 80%. So we have only like 20%, which is on the good side of things, out of which we have nuclear energy, traditional biomass, and the others or the new types, called the new types of renewable energy. Okay, so you can see we are doing part. Okay, we are treading on the right path in the correct direction, but still we have a lot of maybe a path to travel. We have a long way to go. Okay, so let's have a look at the enablers now. Decarbonization, there's need for decarbonization. So you can read more about the Paris Agreement, okay, where lots of countries have maybe signed a, an agreement, a protocol, okay, to say, okay, they need to bring down their uh, CO2 emission with years, okay. Some have been able to achieve that, some are not, but still we are all focused in the same direction. So this is an enabler. Nowadays we have digitization, which is helping us, okay, to move, to be able to control uh, renewable energy. Maybe some 10, 15 years back, it was not possible. So we have enabling technologies nowadays. And then with decentralization, which we are going to see, it's like, instead of having like huge power plant, nowadays it can be miniaturized. So you can have one where you can install in your, in your house or like wind, Turbines initially in the past, it was only like farms, big ones. Nowadays, we are going to show you a few pictures about how you can integrate that in your building itself. It's going to be part of the architecture. Okay, so DG drivers, technological development. We have three, we have just seen, but let's focus maybe on only one technological development. So, wind, solar, wave, and biofuel technologies are much more developed than they used to be. Maybe in the past, ask your maybe parents, grandparents, because they will tell you maybe wind, they, they, they thought that yes, you could harness the power from wind or PV and so on, but the technology is only available like affordably, okay, which can be bought, okay, and reasonable as well. Only these current years. This is a graph that we have on the right hand side on the slide, is what we call the Swan Sun effect, okay, just like the Moose Law that you have learned most probably in IT. So as the cost, okay, and the processing power is going to increase, the cost is going to decrease with time. It's the same for PV, okay? Crystalline silicon PV cell, how it was in 1977. I was not there, I don't know about you. So from there, it was like 76 USD, okay, per watt. So to produce one watt of maybe of energy electricity from solar at that point in time, was 76 USD. Right now, it's around 0 0.74. So that was in around 2013. Right now we are in 2021. So it should have gone much, much lower again. So you can see how it is decreasing exponentially, drastically decreasing. That's what we call the crystalline, uh, the Swanson effect. So when global manufacturing capacity of solar panels double, so we are able to produce more. So average price of producing this panel dropped to around 20%. So every time we're doubling our capacity to produce solar panel is that the cost is going to go down. So that's why we are able to get, it's more affordable. People can, can have it. They can do a break-even analysis. So they are investing so much of, of, of their money or funds in such a project. So they can get back their return on investment much lower with one or two years up to maybe three years, they're able to recover the investment. So now this is something which is interesting for, for developers and, and different people. Okay, let's have a look at the average renewable power generation costs in fossil fuel range in 2017. So this you're going to, on the left-hand side, you're going to have a look at uh, different types of renewable energy. We have biomass, geothermal, hydro, solar PV, concentrated solar power. So we have usually most of the energies that we have renewable energy comes from the sun. Okay, even wind, it comes from the sun because it's the way that the sun heats the water, the air and so on, which make it move. So ultimately we have most of energy ultimately. Okay, it's not maybe directly. All of these are linked with solar. So solar is going to convert lots of energy coming to the earth. It's converted into different types of energy. Maybe if it is, uh, plant, 
okay? It's going to be converted into chemical energy. Then when we are going to burn the plant, that part we call biomass, we burn the plant, we cut it into smaller pieces, we burn it, we get energy. So this is a form of renewable energy, but ultimately it comes from, from the plant, yes, chemical energy, but the, the main source well, from the from the sun, same for the wind and everything. Hydro, you have the water cycle. Remember the water cycle, water is going to be evaporated. How does water evaporate? By being, when it is being heated by sun, then it goes through the water cycle. It's going to become droplets, precipitation, rain, and then it's on the highlands, going to go down, it's going to turn the turbine. Again, hydro is one, it's ultimately connected to, to solar. Then we have photovoltaic, which is an effect in itself. Okay, chemical effect, when incidence of, of uh, solar radiation on that is going to convert that into this silicon layers that you have and, and different impurities that you add to that is going to convert that into uh, solar, into electrical energy. Concentrated power is where you, where you need to, oops, what's happening? Where you're going to focus the rays on the sun onto it, onto a structure where you're going to have molten, uh, maybe com uh, component, Okay, molten, maybe salts and so on, which can be used to heat water and so on. So different types of, of renewable energy. So this is going to give you the cost. So maybe a brief idea about how, how much is going to cost. So this is on the horizontal axis is a cost, USD per kilowatt hour. And you see that hydro is the least cost, like uh, in terms of cost, you're going to give, you can have hydro, but it depends on the topology of the country. Okay, it's not easy to have hydro everywhere. So it depends maybe in mountainous regions and so on, but it's going to be the least cost solution. And then you have onshore wind. Okay, onshore is what you have on land. Offshore is what you have in the sea. You will see that offshore is going to cost much more. Okay, why? Because it's about the capital investment. It is in the sea, you need to have underground, no, not underground, but maybe undersea cables. That is going to have some transfer station and so on. It's much more complex, okay? And then you have concentrated solar, which is nearly on the other end, the high end side of the, uh, of the spectrum. Okay, it's much more, but it's going to come with some, I think the cost is going to go down as well. Solar PV is maybe in the, in the correct range for the time being, okay? And this is just going to give you an APSU, okay? An idea about how are the different, maybe cost component or how they, 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 mm, they are on a specific range, these different types of energy. Now, now that you understand maybe the drivers, how they have, how they have been enabled okay, with technologies the lower uh, drive, low uh, cost nowadays, let's have a look at, let's understand the concept of distributed generation. Okay, the definition. So it is, so it is an amalgam. I've not been able to find a, a one best definition. Okay, I've mixed a few definitions together to get a, a proper understanding of what is meant by distributed generation. So let's start. It's a production of electric power by generating sets. This is true for all, but relatively smaller than central plant. Central plants, they can be in terms of 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, 200, 500 megawatts. So they are huge centralized power plants. But these ones that we are going to consider are smaller ones. Relatively speaking, so maybe for for Pakistan, a, a really a, a smaller one is going to be very big for Mauritius, okay, depending on the on the size of the country and the energy consumption. The definition continues connected to the distribution network. We are going to see what is meant by distribution network shortly, and which is not centrally. This part is meant by dispatching. Dispatching is your controlling. Usually, we have a control center which is going to control which load. Okay, maybe on merit order. You have different maybe constraint for that. If it is renewable, it's going to be automatically on. Then you have merit order, which one is going to cost less for the utility to operate. So there is a form of control, but for renewable energy, maybe those connected at transmission levels that can be dispatched, but that you have maybe on your house. How are they going to control that on your house automatically? So it can't be automatically controlled maybe from a centralized maybe control system. So they are not centrally dispatchable. And which may also involve energy storage devices. So we, we talk about energy storage devices shortly in our, first, uh, in our first lecture on power system series. So you can refer to that to, to learn more about energy storage devices. So basically, this is a picture about the definition. What does distributed generation looks like? Now the case for DG, we have just maybe a summary. 
heavy, we have been relying heavily on fossil fuel. For us, it comes mainly from the Middle East and so on, where you have most of the time, maybe um, wars and so on, instability, political instability. It's a bit maybe not so easy over there. So we don't know, maybe the fuel price is going to go up, go down. We don't know what's going to happen. We can have a, a shortage of fuel. What will we do? How can we run the country? Okay, so it's heavy reliance. Now that maybe we are all blessed with sunlight, why don't we harness the power of sun? So it is maybe besides being cleaner energy, it's going to decrease our reliance on fossil fuel. Okay, it enhances power flow for reduced transmission distribution losses. This is what is said. We are going to confirm that later on. Deferment of investment on transmission system. So if you are not, we are going to do that when you're going to the losses. If you are not building, if we maybe our load, you as well, maybe at home, maybe you have new equipment that has come up. We maybe 10 years back, you didn't have electrical equipment. So you need power. So every human beings in and across your neighborhood in your country, they are adding different loads, okay? To your, maybe to your uh, electrical load for your personal uh, house, and then maybe for the company and so on, ultimately what's happening? The country needs more to produce more electrical energy. The transmission system needs to be able to transmit all that, to handle all that load, but maybe it is choked. It got like, it has a limitation. But do you, do you know what is the impact of building a new transmission line nowadays? It's high. At times, it's not even possible. It's not feasible. So while instead of why build a new centralized power plant, while we can build small or smaller, like uh, I think I lost you for, for a short while, maybe a disconnection. Let me just check. OK. Hope you can see me. Let me just check this one again. Okay, let me just put that into picture again. Pin me, that should be share the screen. Okay, there we go. That was a short break for you. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's continue. So, so deferment, so we can, now that we have, instead of having centralized power plant, we can have maybe small power plants in your neighborhood. So there's no need for transmission of energy from centralized power plant. It's what you call deferment of this one. Efficient use of readily available primary. So maybe there was mountains, running water and so on. You could just install a hydropower electric plant. It's going to cost maybe capital investment yet, but then you're going to have what you call free energy environmental friendly, we talk about that, avoiding the construction of large power plant. It's, it's not easy nowadays to build huge power plant, okay? And let's have a look at what is meant by distribution now. So we know only about the generation, centralized power plant. Then we have, we need to, to transmit power, huge power along transmission line, lattice towers and so on towards, because usually power, it is maybe centralized, maybe next to the port, where they have coal, where they have fuel easily in. You can't have like a power plant in the middle of the city. It's not going to be reasonable to bring all that fuel here and so on. So it is usually located quite far away. Power needs to transmit through these like transmission line, and then it needs to be distributed to the load centers. Okay, maybe in Mauritius it is 22 kV. At your place, it can be 33 kV, 11 kV. Okay, and then it is distributed, secondary distribution to the end customer. This is what is meant by the traditional flow of energy. So now when we talk about distributed generation, it's not about connection. Usually all generation centralized power plant, they're connected on the generation side. But then for all the generation side of the transmission, they're connected to the transmission system. But for distributed generation, it is mandatory that they are connected to, it is a condition for them to be regarded as distributed generation for them to be connected onto the distribution network. So on what we have on this part, or maybe 22 kV. In some countries, if you have maybe 400 kV and so on, 66 kV as well may be regarded as distribution depending on the size of the grid or the different voltage level, okay? Or even on the level, low voltage side next on your rooftop, okay? Okay, so this, this is what we call a huge power plant. Okay, this is what that is classified as centralized power plant. These are going to be connected to the 
uh, what we call the transmission network. So these are not regarded as distribution generation. These are two huge, they are form, PV forms and so on. These are not regarded, they're not classified as distributed generation. Distributed generation, it is like this one, maybe connected on your rooftop, or maybe vertical axis wind turbine, okay, new types of wind turbine, maybe that you can mount on your, on your rooftop as well. Let's see the evolution. This is what we call, you can see, this is what we had maybe previously. It would look maybe as an ISO for some, okay? Maybe it's like big, big fans and so on on top of it. It's not pleasing, isn't it? But this, let's see how things are moving. And this is what we have in London nowadays, okay? This structure that you see in the middle of the building, is this is a form of what you call vertical axis wind turbine, okay? It's going to produce electricity. Again, the figure on the right, this is producing power for this building. But you can see it on top, which is free, like holes in it, you have the turbines in there. So it is integrated in the building itself. It is, it is able to produce energy. The advantage of, of, of maybe vertical axis wind turbine is that you don't need wind in only one direction. So you can have wind from different direction is going to work, okay? And there's one other technology. Let me just see if I have one more slide. This is it. So the building nowadays, the design of the building in such a way is done in such a way that it is, is going to accelerate wind in these areas where you have the wind turbine. It's what we call building augmented wind turbine. Building augmented wind turbine. This one, we already have it in, in China. So you can, you won't see it. It's not going to be an ISO, but it's going to help. It's contribute maybe to 30% of the consumption, electrical consumption of the, of the building itself. This is what we have in Pakistan currently from what I've been able to collect. Hydropower plants contributing to 29% of the energy mix, thermal 61%, nuclear 5%, and renewable energy from wind by biomass and so on is around 5%. So you can see how it looks already for your country. And what are these, what you call the dark sides one, the red one, thermal and nuclear. Nuclear is not renewable, it is maybe on the middle, okay, but it is not renewable because we, the, the energy, the materials that we are using as source of power, it is going to be depleted with time. Okay, it is clean, okay, it's not polluting, but it is going to be depleted with time. But as we say, sun, maybe it's going to be depleted well in, in, in time, but not, but not like currently. So what we have is thermal and, and nuclear that we need to try to minimize in terms of our energy mix. Okay, advantage and disadvantage now. Advantage, economic, no investment, no need for investment in big centralized power plant and transmission line, what we can call free energy. Maybe you fit and forget. Maybe you have a solar power on solar panel on your house, just install it. You enjoy electricity free energy. There's a, some maintenance that needs, you need to clean it and so on, but it is, it's not like huge investments that you need. Like for, for a fuel a, a power plant, you need to bring in fuel every day. You need to have tanks of fuel pouring your generators every day. Then you have the environmental effect is green energy, non-polluting. That's happy, happiness for everyone. Then on the, on the other side of it, we have technical issues which can cover. This is maybe the second part of our session for today. So it may give rise to increase in voltage. It may improve voltage. Yes, I'm telling you, yes. But then it can have negative effects on voltage. Network losses, you're going to see that it can improve, but it can make it much uh, like affect the system completely. Protection malfunction, your power system protection has been designed for one way of uh, like energy flow. Now with two way because energy produced at the lower end, maybe at the customer terminals, maybe you're not using everything this is being exported into the grid, it can go up. So how is your protection going to work? It has not been designed for that. Then you're going to say, see quickly about the power quality that we call harmonics because we are like PV, we, we are going to produce at DC and then we are going to convert to AC. We have a converter to do that. And this conversion is going to add what we call harmonics in the system. Ultimately, the cumulative effects of all these harmonics is going to affect power quality. Let's start with one, okay? Voltage, this, we are going to go slightly technical, but you are, we will be able to understand it. So we have a network, we have the sending end voltage and we have the receiving end voltage on the other side, typical network. 
this is how we the voltage is going to be the voltage based distance according to you okay definitely the sending end is going to be higher than the receiving end because we are going to have voltage drop along the line so sending end is really always greater than the receiving end this is what we have learned at university level isn't it now let's we, and then we have an upper limit in motion it is plus minus six percent most likely in pakistan should be around the same so we can't like we have a declared voltage of 230 volts we are giving people 400 volts we can't okay it is as per the regulation as per the law so we have an upper limit and then we do have a lower limit as well that's why at times when we can't like provide the minimum level we need to add a transformer or maybe increase the sending and voltage with transformer taps and so on so ultimately we have an operating voltage like region within the upper limit and voltage the traditional system is working fine because the sending end receiving end they are both within this limit that's very good isn't it next let me just next we have what we call a, a distributed generation we have a distributed generation here and then we have a second one around here what's going to happen now let's have a look initially yes the voltage ascending and is going down as per our, our understanding of the system due to voltage drop, what's going to happen as a DG? DG number one, distributed generation number one. So the arrow should be, the arrow here is about the load, but the DG is going to inject onto the line. The arrow, the flow here is going to be up. Okay, so what's going to happen? When you have an injection, voltage is going to increase. This is what we have learned as well at the university. Voltage is going to increase, but we are still within the range, isn't it? Again, we are going to have voltage drop between bus bar DG1 to DG2. We are going down. We have another distributed generation on the second bus bar, but where we have distributed generation number two. What's going to happen here? The voltage is going to increase again. Now what we see, we have crossed the upper limit. We are beyond what we were supposed to be providing as per the regulation. This is where the issue is going to happen. Okay, so then you will say, but if you're having a small DG here, you are going to have a small increase, then they still can remain within the tolerance range. Yes, but then there's need to be have a control. But are we controlling? Do we have a mechanism to control all that? This is where the question is going to be asked. Do we have a, a, a mechanism to control how much power, how much like distributed generation are being connected? Maybe your neighbor is just connecting a, a rooftop Okay, another one here and there. So in your locality, like 50%, 70% of people are having distributed generation. It's free, as you said, it's free. In Mauritius, you even have it, the government can give it to you free. There's some scheme where they install it for you free. Okay, so ultimately in the long run, maybe it is still like immature, only like 1%, but with time, what's going to happen? This is where we need to, to take that into. So one of the issues about the voltage constraints that we have. Next, let's talk a bit about the second one, which is network losses. So we said at the beginning of today's lecture that we have the power plant on one side, on the left here, then power, let me just start drawing. Okay, this is the power plant. Okay, power is going to flow in this region. So when we have power flow, we have basically it's current. And when current is flowing, we have what we call I squared R losses. So we have I squared R losses in transformers, in transformers, transformers, in the power lines as well. Okay, so it is inherent to a power system. But then let's take, for example, let's take this example that, okay, this was producing maybe, I think we have it in the slide. Let's go into slide. Set. Okay, origin of TND losses, we explained that to you. So it is important for, it is a metric, okay, for power utilities to keep losses within low range because it is a loss, okay? You are losing power. The more losses you are using at I squared loss, which is loss as heat, okay? You are, you could have used this energy for better purpose to supply people, okay? So there are ways by which you can decrease your network losses, maybe using bigger size of conductors, better quality transformers and so on. But then let's have a look at how, what is the impact, how distributed generation is going to affect this equation. So when SSDG or the small scale distributed generation gets into the equation, let's have a look. Again, let's take an example of a simple power line. 
Okay, we have a sending end. On the side, we have the receiving end, isn't it? We are supplying a load of 50 megawatt. Agree? And then we introduce a distributed generation here, but we are going to vary, we are going to change the output from this distributed generation. Let's have a look at how this is going to be the size of the distributed generation on one scale. On the other scale, you are going to monitor what's going to be the I squared dollar cell in this line. Okay, we have a line here. We're going to monitor the I squared all losses in this line. You help me out. Oops. Where is it gone? Oh, I think I had to draw it. Okay, so basically, initially, this is the I squared all losses. Agree? So initially, it's going to be high. Then let's say we have like 10 megawatt. We, are, we have changed that to 10 megawatt. So basically, 10 megawatt is going to be produce locally, let's call that produce locally. So how much power is going to flow? Initially it was 50 megawatt, but now it's going to be 40 megawatt because 10 megawatt is being produced by the distributed generation. So power is going to go down, current is going to go down. What's going to happen to I squared dollars? It's going to go down a bit, isn't it? Next, let's change the color. This one is producing 20 megawatt. So how much will energy flow? It's going to be 30 here. Addition 20 plus 30, 20 plus 30 is going to be 50. So what's going to happen? Four pluses. So less power flow, less current is going to go down. That's very good because we are decreasing our losses, isn't it? Decreasing losses is good for the utility. Then let's go, let's change color again. Let's go to blue, 30 megawatt. Okay, again 30, this is 30. This is going to be only 20 megawatt flowing. Again, smaller losses again. Now. Let's change color, let's go for a beautiful color. Let's go for 50 megawatt. We are now producing 50 megawatt, chuck, chuck, 50 megawatt. So this one, this local load is producing the full load required, not the full load, yeah, we are producing the full power required by the load. So this one is going to be zero. There's no power flow. So minimum losses, let's call that here, minimum losses. That's very good. We have decreased our losses across, along the line. But now what's going to happen? Let's say this one increases. We don't have control, we said. This goes to 60. 60 is going to start going up again because at so 60, 50 is being consumed. 10 is now going in the reverse direction. So it is going towards the, the grid. It can supply different localities now. So it's going to go up. We are going to have current flowing in the reverse direction. So as we go up, the reset is going to be like this. Up to, let's say we have, <clears throat> We have 100 megawatts being produced, 50 megawatts being consumed, 50 megawatts. So we are back to square one where we started. That's still good because we are not worse than before. Now, if this continues to increase over and above 100 megawatt, 110, 120 megawatt, what's going to happen? The losses is going to be worse than before. Okay, it's going to go up. It is above the initial limit that it was. Okay, so we need to know how much we are providing in a specific network. We can't just put on increasing and increasing and increasing. Okay, let's clear that. Let's move to the next slide. So if the increase in losses is a result of extra distributed generation, it is normally not a major concern. It is a concern in terms of losses, but then it is minimum as compared to the, the benefits that it actually gives to the utility. So the percentage of losses will usually be within acceptable limit if the hosting capacity, hosting capacity is a technical term to see how much can the network take in terms of renewable energy or distributed generation without affecting the kind of correct operation of the system. It's not impacting the voltage rise, as we said, Voltage is not going beyond control. So we are within the hosting capacities of the network, power quality, which we are going to see, as well as losses. From an environmental viewpoint, the gain from renewable energy is much higher than the increase in losses. So increases losses definitely is going to affect the environment because we are losing energy in terms of heat. But if we, if we see what is the advantage you are getting in terms of the amount of energy, which is produced in a cleaner way, so this like supersede the extra losses which are being given by the I squared dollars for higher capacity. Okay, so I think we can skip. 
So we have seen two criteria for the time being. We have seen voltage, how it can, if, we, if it is left uncontrolled, we can go to such a limit that it is crossing the limit. For losses, we see that it can, it's going to come to a minimum point. Then if we keep on increasing, okay, above the load that we have currently in the network, is going, that's what you call reverse power flow, is going to go up again and it can cross the initial value, the threshold that had at the beginning. Third one now, we are going to have a look at protection. <clears throat> so we have a grid. We have two lines. We have a bus ball. We have two lines, circuit broker number one, circuit broker number two. Let's say we have a fault down this line. What's going to happen? Who is going to supply? There's going to be a fault current coming from the grid across circuit broker number two to feed the fault. What's going to happen? Circuit broker number two is going to trip because it is like an overcurrent, which is going to sense as for the normal protection, overcurrent protection. So it's going to trip. So this part of the line, okay, what you have downward of circuit broker number two is going to become de-energized. They won't have power. They're going to do the repairs and so on later on. But what happens after circuit number one, CB1, is going to remain healthy. This is what we call discrimination. Okay, discrimination in terms of protection system. So one part of the network is going to remain healthy at the circuit broker number one. Whatever happens on circuit broker number two is going to be disconnected. It is a normal practice. Now let's introduce a distributed generation. Let's say it is a hydropower plant. Okay, we do have some, we're not going to go into the detail like PV. It's not going to contribute to the full current, but let's take a distributed generation, which is able to produce like fault current. As soon as we introduce the distributed generation, if we have a fault downstream of circuit breaker number two, this distributed generation is going to contribute to the fault current as well because it is a source of energy. It is seeing like a fault, it is going to contribute to this fault. So we have two components of the fault current. One, the original one from the grid and then from the distributed generation. Now what will happen? What will happen to circuit breaker number one? It's going to trip other because it is sensing an overcurrent. It's going to trip. So now we have a fault downstream of circuit breaker number two. Both circuit number one and two are going to trip. So we have a what we call a complete breakdown or a blackout of the system. Why? Only because there was an addition of a distributed generation. So we can look for ways. There is we are always like we can fine tune the protection system, but we need to go into the details. Okay, it's not easy. You have, if you have like intelligent, uh, maybe units like relays and so on, this can be done. But when you're going to have switch fuse, which is a static device, you can't change, you can't program a switch fuse. So then things are going to become difficult. See an example, another example, same principle. Let's say we have a fault on circuit breaker number two. No, after circuit breaker number two, who will supply the fault before any addition of distributed generation? Is going to be the grid. So the grid is going to provide full current, higher current, which is going to be seen by circuit broker number four. What's going to happen? It's going to trip. However, circuit number number three is going to remain on. CB1, CB2 is going to remain on. No issue. Okay, it is good uh, discrimination in terms of protection. Let's introduce your friend now. It's not my friend, it's your friend. It's distributed generation after circuit breaker number two. This one is said is going to contribute to the fault again. Now what's going to happen? CB4 definitely is going to trip. CB2 is going to trip as well because it is sensing an overcurrent flowing in the reverse direction as well as circuit breaker number three. So if circuit breaker number three fail open, CB1 as well, whatever happens, it won't have electricity. So it's a whole power system which is affected. Okay, this is one problem. Another problem now, when you were designing, maybe uh, sizing circuit broker number four, they took into consideration, we don't have distributed generation when they were designing the line. We are talking about existing line. So it was sized maybe to cater for a fault current of 10 kilo ampere. But nowadays, so we have only one distributed generation. Let's say you have two or three distributed, all of these are going to contribute to this fault. What, so the, the full current is going to much, much, much higher 
than it was that circuit breaker was designed for. So it may rupture, it may cause the circuit breaker to explode because it is very high current and it was not designed to handle such a high current. So it is, it's like not only you're losing your power system in terms of power, okay, your everything is, is blackout, but then your equipment can sustain explosion. You see the amount of power it is receiving. Okay, so importance of full current, this is what we said, the seriousness, seriousness of the damage can become much bigger. So it was not designed, it was designed maybe for 10 kilo ampere, maybe only downward fall, but now you're having different contributors. They're adding maybe fuel to your fire is going to explode. So serious set of damage, sustained fault condition, that fault condition may be sustained because maybe the breaker has tripped at the head, but it is on some distributed generation, we are still powering on this, this fault. This is what can happen, okay? And proper sizing of cables, we said switch gear, protective devices needs to be resized and need to do recalculation on all the protective equipment that we have on the, on the system. This is what can happen, melting of or explosion of circuit breakers. <clears throat> Major concerns of protection. So before installing distributed generation into distribution network, from a network protection point of view, the following aspect should be considered. So protection of the distribution equipment from internal faults. So within you should have maybe a circuit broker to protect your own distributed generation as all electrical equipment. Protection of the faulted distribution network from false current supply by the DG. So you're protecting not only your device, your distributed generation, but that your network, your distribution network from any faults which can propagate from your distributed generation to the network. Let's say your neighbor has a, has a distributed generation. There's a fault on his distributed generation. This fault is propagating to your installation in your house. Okay, this is not good. Okay, it is a problem with the installation and it is coming back to your installation. So this needs to be taken care of. Islanding, what is islanding? So you are in a, in, a, in, a, in a vicinity and you just lose the main supply, the power from the utility. Then ultimately, currently we won't have power because we have lost the mains. But if you're having distributed generation, if you neighbors from around are producing power, they are going to feed onto your, your house. Definitely, they are not going to, to meet your load requirement. You're going to have lower voltage and uh, it's going to cause different, maybe malfunctioning of your equipment as well. Impact of distributed generation of existing protection. This we have seen how it is going to affect the distribution system protection, which has not been designed for reverse power flow and for additional fault current brought about by distributed generation. So all these, you see protection is very important. It can create big, big problems. So that's why we need to be very careful about how we are, we just need to integrate it properly in a proper way with a correct calculation all through. It's not only at the lower end where you're, it's about the network itself needs to be recalculated and reconfigured. Last one, okay. The, the small thing which can happen is about the power quality. We have uh, PV, okay, they are going to be, uh, you're going to have what we call inverters to convert the DC to AC because most of, of our load that we use nowadays are AC power, okay? So DC is produced, uh, PV is going to produce DC power, we need to convert that into AC. So this equipment, which we call it an inverter, it, it has electronics, power electronics in that. So when they are converting DC to AC, this power electronics is going to cause, to, to, to inject what we call a, not a disturbance, but a distorted waveform onto the network. Ultimately, the network, the voltage or the current is going to be distorted. So this is what we expect from the utility, a clean, okay, sine wave, but ultimately a distorted, harmonically distorted waveform is that, this is what we can see on the third figure. Okay, this is not good. So why? So we are having like lots of load already. Your laptop, it is powered from DC, from AC, but then you do have a small buffer is converting this AC to DC. So all, nearly all, your television is powered from AC, but inside is converted to DC. Your, your different equipment that you have around your home, your mobile phone even, 
okay? You are powering that from an AC socket, but this is being converted to DC to charge your mobile phone. So nearly all, if I can say 70% of your loads, except motors, okay? Like others, 70% of your loads are ultimately DC. So you have lots of power electronics in that. And each of these equipment, they are contributing to what we call harmonically distorted waveform. Even your, your lights. Initially, in the past, we had uh, incandescent lamp. Nowadays, let's, let's be more uh, energy efficient. We are using a CFL lamp or LED lamp. But these LED lamps, they are powered. LED is an electronic device that's going to be powered by DC power. So what's going to happen is going to add more harmonics to the system. So this is how it's going to affect your system. And harmonics have its whole array of, of like disadvantage. It's going to heat up equipment. Usually the, the current in neutral, if you have three phases or Y and B, if the load is balanced, the current in the neutral is going to be zero because all these, let me just draw that. This one, the third one as well, they're going to cancel each other. It's going to become, if you sum all that, it's going to be zero. But when we have such a wave, it won't cancel. You have like second one here, third one. It's not going to cancel here. This one was canceling maybe with this one. This was okay, it was fine. It was a perfect sine wave. But if it is not, it's not going to cancel. So ultimately your, your current in the neutral is going to be very high. And usually we design, we, we design for the sizing of the neutral conductor is going to be beyond. So it can cause heating, heating can cause fire as well. So it has a whole array of problem attached to harmonics in system. And one, one source of harmonics, a new source of harmonics is PV as well as wind. Wind, they have uh, power drives, which is going to control the speed and so on. These are electronic devices as well. So in this part, we are basically do, but we do have ways by which we can improve that. We can add filters, but research is still being undertaken because when we add filters, filters are basically uh, inductor and capacitor. We already have resistor on one side, so it's going to be a bit of resonance which can occur and resonance can have different effects as well. So this, I'll leave it here, okay? Maybe room for you to read more about the power quality issue. Okay, so this is how it looks like. This is an output from a, a wind farm, what we call an aeolian farm, okay, in Mauritius. It is like 9.35 megawatt, but you see that it never reaches, only once over one week it reaches above seven megawatt. So basically this is the shape of it. You can see it is, you have it for one week already. It's one week. Can you see any, can you be able to make up any like uh, regularity in that? Is it like, uh, can you predict what will be the, uh, maybe the, the shape, the amount of power generated maybe on day eight? You won't be able to do that. Maybe by looking at that. So it is unpredictable. This is what we call variable renewable energy. It's not only renewable energy, we said hydro is renewable energy. That's good. It's going to give you firm power. Burning of bagasse, burning of biomass is going to give you firm power. That's very good. But when it comes to wind, when it comes to PV, the two most like famous one, okay, in terms of renewable energy that we're trying to put in our grid, this is a type of waveform you're going to expect. And it's both for wind. This is for uh, PV as well. Another wind form, uh, not wind, but PV form in Mauritius. 1.92 megawatt capacity, it really reaches one point, not even 1.5, okay? And you see, it's going to have a shape, a general shape, a bell shape, but it's never the same. You can't predict what's going to happen on the eight, the nine and so on. So that's what we call variable renewable energy. Now in terms of load forecasting, how is the power system going to look? Okay, they need to know how much PV, we are having so many PV. Some of them remember they're not dispatchable. We don't, the power the control systems, they, they are not able to control, switch on, off, increase, decrease, they can't have them control. So it is like mushrooming everywhere and everyone is just connecting, connecting, connecting. There's no control on that. What's going to happen, okay? So initially in the past, plant generation, we know that generation must be equal to the demand every, every time, okay? So that frequency can remain stable, okay? The CV, it is not, it's always true for a power system. 
Okay, so we say that plant generation in the past was a function, F is a function of a demand forecast, how much we have been able to, to forecast the demand. It was easy because there was only one variable, which was about demand. So we are able to say, okay, the demand is going to be 50. I'm going to produce 50. That's, that's fine. So it was a function of post demand. Nowadays, what is plant generation? How much power do we need to add? It's not only one parameter, it's only about forecasting the demand. It's about forecasting the PV output, forecasting the wind output. And if we have BSS, is battery energy storage system, how much power can we extract from the BES as well? So it is a multivariable forecasting, which we can't do with our brains alone. We'll need to have software, maybe a protocol in place or framework that needs to be, to be in place to be able to calculate that. Okay, and with are so much uncertainties as well. Okay, so ultimately we can have data weather prediction, weather classification, aggregation of all that, plus minus so many things, so that you can say, okay, let's predict what will be the output from each and every one. So it is a, a science in itself, which you can read much more about that in your own time. Okay, so it's, it is a burden for power grid management. How? the power system is going to make up for that, to be able to accept, to accommodate all that. It's like invisible. We, they, they are not seeing what's happening, okay? But they need to predict based on that. So it's difficult work. Okay, next thing, okay, in terms of the bigger picture now, we said there is a morning demand in blue. Then we have a maybe a dip in demand during the day. And then we have an evening demand. Usually, this is where we are going to have maximum peak solar power. Let's remember this. Let's come back with that later. So this is what you call a load duration curve. This is a daily load curve, okay? Maybe from morning, from midnight to midnight. How the load on the system is going to, to change? It may, it may be one peak, two peak, currently in Mauritius, we have three peak. I don't know about what we have in Pakistan, but this is a shape of it. That's good, isn't it? Now, you see that, yes, we need energy, renewable energy. We need to be, environmental friendly, it's free energy. All these that we have, been, all these drivers and enablers, we are pushing that forward. Yes, let's come up with solar power. This is the amount of solar power being produced during the day, maybe from eight to around five, three PM. That's very good, isn't it? We are getting free energy. How will, so the curve, this is the amount of power in yellow, the amount of power from the sun. So ultimately, what will be the, output from the utility itself. So if this is the, the, from PV, from people that they have on their house in, 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 or in uh, yellow. So ultimately the curve is going to change. This is it because the utility now, because some of it is already produced by the person, different people, the utility is going to produce less. This is going to be the shape, the new shape that you have here. This is a new shape, oops. The new shape of the graph, the low duration curve. Ultimately, this is the amount which is being consumed. This is still the amount being consumed, but it is from this one. This is going to fill this one up. That's very good. Okay, we are helping, isn't it? Now, if it becomes bigger, we are adding more solar energy. So the, the, the amount of power contribution from solar is going to be more, isn't it? What's going to happen to our curve? We are going to produce less during this amount. This is going to be the shape, the ultimate shape amount of power produced by utility. This is going to be it. still good. We are contributing, we are helping. And then it's going to be much, much, much higher. What's going to happen? We are going to have a sharp dip. This is going to be the new the daily load curve. Ultimately, what's going to happen? This is it. You are going down, that's very good. Then you need to go up. This is what we call a ramp. You have seen a lot of, of input maybe function. This is a rep, and this is bad for the utility. So you need to have a sharp rep, maybe to have engines or, or the traditional engines, which are going to just go up from maybe zero to maybe maximum power. This is it, maximum power in a short while. And it's going to cause wear and tear of your engines. So mechanic, mechanically speaking, this is bad for the utility, and you're going to where your engine is going to decrease its lifetime as well. So we are saying yes to renewable energy from the sun, yes, but this is going to affect this ramp effect that's going to cause, is going to affect the power system ultimately. 
Okay, so basically it's what we call a, I don't know if you have heard it before, we call it a duck curve. Okay, this is it. So as we increase in terms of power generated from the sun, the dip is going to be bigger and you're going to have the duck curve, it's going to be steeper and it's going to create havoc. It's going to create maybe stress on the mechanical part of the generator, the centralized power plant. Do you remember the fuel power plant and so on? Or any firm power plant as well, okay? So this is it, the ramp curve. So increased ramp, potential over generation as well. Okay, different problems which can crop up on that. It is a problem, but we need to find solution for that. Okay, it's not like, okay, your problem, we are going to stop you. No, there are things that we need to do. It's not only like blindly adding onto the system. We need to take cognizance. We need to be aware about what can be the problems which can arise as well. Okay, so we have seen about the, uh, the curve. So now, as we have seen, it's not the end. It's not like, okay, we have a barrier. We can't do anything more. No, we can have battery energy storage device to store maybe part of this energy to help us decrease this threat and so on. Battery energy storage can decrease the variability as well. Okay, make it more smooth. Artificial inertia. So when we are adding PV or when we are missing what we call inertia in our system, let's say you reach home, you just switch on the light. Where does this light? Was it like ready? The utility was, okay, someone is going to light up. We need five or 10, 10 watt. We get ready, he's lighting up. Push 10 watt, no, something like that. So where does this 10 watt come? Because we say that demand and supply should be balanced at all times. When you're switching off your light, it is like the engines. Okay, the generators, traditional generators, when they are rotating, they have a momentum in them. When you're going to switch on the light, is going to, going to get energy from this momentum first. It's going to decrease its, it's going to not maybe decelerate a bit, okay? It's going to decrease its speed to be able to provide this additional power that it had in its momentum, in its, in its in this, what we call the inertia, in its moving part. And then the, the feedback control loop over there is going to, to, to push in more fuel to be able to accelerate the, the system again. So initially this, fraction of a second, it is, it's coming from the inertia. But if you're replacing everywhere with PV or, or wind uh, powered uh, plant and so on, what's going to happen? You're going to lose inertia. Your system is going to be less and less stable. Okay, inertia is going to keep your system stable. But then what people are, are planning to do, countries where you have high, maybe renewable energy, variable renewable energy, they are coming up with artificial inertia. Maybe flywheel, Okay, it's just going to turn. It's not producing, it's not doing any useful work. You have to call flywheels are going to rotate, rotate, rotate. And then when there's need for that, it's going to provide inertia. So a rotating device, which is being made to rotate by the grid, okay, it's not producing power in the, in the generators that we had, the generators are producing power. That's why they're rotating. Here it is like a motor which is turning. Then when it, it needs power, this motor is going to provide this inertia. To, to stabilize the grid. So we have artificial inertia. So it's, it's still a thing that you can read about, or you can have the virtual power plant, which we explained in the first lecture of the power system series at uh, Karachi University on campus. So this is what we have to cover. <clears throat> I mean, maybe rushing if you may be, maybe it's one hour already. Yeah? So let's quickly have a summary. We define it. Remember what is the definition for distributed generation? Not centrally dispatchable, connected on a distribution network. It is like mm, mostly maybe from renewable energy as well, mostly, okay. If you think that we are still remember from the definition, what are the drivers? Remember uh, iceberg, uh, uh, rising sea level, super cyclone, El Nino, and then we had CO2 being emitted. We need the Paris Agreement all the way. We have enablers, new technology coming in, the cost of renewable energy going down. We have seen four main issues, which, which are voltage, okay, within or outside this bound, losses that we have in the system, how it can help to decrease losses, but after a certain point, it can increase the losses as well. We have seen the havoc it can create in terms of protection for the protection system. Then we have quickly have a look at power quality, how it's going to distort the voltage waveform, which is going to affect. So you can read about the, the amount of devastation that power quality can have as well. 
Then we stress uh, from VOE, variable renewable energy sources, what is the stress that, that the system control is going to have in, in planning, in forecasting. And then we discuss about the duck curve, quack, quack. Okay. And then we say it is not the end. We have a way forward. We need to, to read more. We need to, to maybe then the grid needs to change. Okay, it can't remain as a traditional grid, a conventional grid. We need to put in more smart devices, maybe lots of communication should be two flow of communication. So, and so on. there is a way forward, but we need to start working on that. So there's room to for working, maybe for power quality to design filters, variable filters as well. And that's it. That should be it from me. So now if you have any questions, we can handle a few of the questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Now, if anyone has any questions, uh, you are invited to type them in the chat box. <clears throat> so I can I'm seeing, wow, let's see. So I'm reading the question, given the intermediate nature of renewable energy and the high investment cut associated with BSS, won't we still need conventional energy sources? Uh, this is my Shamil, this is my uh, views as well, okay? So there are some countries, you will, you will see, there are some countries we have gone 100% renewable energy. That's very good. But if you look well, if you read between the lines, they are not producing 100% from solar, from PV. They are not producing 100% from wind. They have lots, maybe 70, 80% from hydro. So hydro is going to give you firm power. It's not variable. The issue is not about renewable energy or not. It's about the intermittent nature, which you have highly uh, highlighted in your question, the intermittent nature, which gives it variability. So this is an issue definitely that we need to, to, to handle. And till we can't handle it completely, my opinion, okay, is that we need to keep these conventional sources. There is need, we can't like just do away with that, like within next 10 years or so. It's going to take its time. What measures must be undertaken or what solution do we have to prevent voltage exceeding? So we need to be able to control, okay? We need to know how much of renewable energy are being connected to the grid, okay? How much are injecting in the grid? We need to have a visibility on that. And then we need to monitor. As a utility, you need to monitor what, what are the different voltages. So no need for you nowadays, okay, to go on site and so on every day to measure. We have smart meters. Okay, and you can communicate, you can write a small program in the smart meter, you say, okay, whenever, so it's going to be smart meter for everyone, okay, every customer that you have on your grid. So every time the voltage is nearing the limit, maybe send a message or ring the alarm. So you're going to get, it's going to have connection, Wi-Fi, whatever connection, 3G connection, it's going to send a message to the, maybe to the main center. We may be having an issue over there because the voltage is rising. Then the UT can come to a certain to check what's happening over there. So there are things that can be done, but it is research that needs to be done. It is like you as engineers, you need to come up with ideas as well, enabling technologies. Please explain artificial inertia again. Oh, so what is artificial inertia? You have what we call a flywheel, okay? Just, uh, just like a turning body. So when you're providing power to that, it's just like a motor, okay? It is rotating. It is rotating, rotating, rotating. It's still rotating when you remove power. So there's a power cut, we remove power. It's not going to stop rotating right away. It's going to decrease its axis. It's going to decelerate slowly. While it is decelerating, what's happening? It is, it is move, movement. So if it is in a coil, it can be used to produce electricity as well. Okay, so that's what we call flywheel effect. Okay, and then, so when it is like, it's not, operating as a motor, it is decelerating. While decelerating, it is in a coil, a set of coal. It can be used to produce this extra power that can provide, that can be provided to the grid. Like this is in the, the inertia that we were talking about. It's much more complicated than that, but to keep it simple, this is what we have, uh, we can explain it in these terms. Well, Mohamed Umer, can we replace conventional energy sources with large PV form and wind form for peak hours and transmit it using, yes. So usually PV form and, and wind form for peak hours. PV form, the issue with PV form is that uh, we, we it's only like during daytime. So usually, depending on, on countries, 
the peak is in the evening where everyone is at home. But if you have a, a, a power system where you have lots of maybe industries and so on, it's going to be during the day. Then it's good that you have energy produced from PV. You no need for you to store that. You are producing, you need that, you are going to give that. In Mauritius, we have lots of, of air conditioning load nowadays. And this is being met. As well as it is hot, it is very hot. So the sun is out. You are going to need air conditioning. So when you need air conditioning, in the same time, during the same period, your PV are giving maximum power because the full sunlight. So it is as if counterbalancing PV and air conditioning load. Okay, let me just check the second part of the question. But with the advantage of wind farm is that it can generate 24 hours. But you can't, you, you said for peak hours, that's very good. But you can't control that. It can be okay. We are, we, we, we hope that we are going to get good wind during the peak hour. But what if it is not? It is calm. At that specific point, it is calm, no wind. So you can't like predict is we are going to use that for peak. We, it is like on a, on, a, on a priority basis. We have renewable energy maybe from the wind or PV. Let's put that in the grid. We're not going to curtail that. This is what the current system is. We just need to, to give it because it won't be able to store its energy. So let's give that on the grid. So we, what we can control is maybe from the fossil fuel, maybe from uh, gas uh, engines and so on, we can control that. But it's a bit difficult to control PV form, to curtail them or to release them as such in peak hours. We don't have control on that for the time being. HVDC, we can, we can, so we can store that, if you mean we can store that, and then we can transmit that using a high voltage distribution. Yeah, this can be done as well. How about if we go for hybrid PV system? Yes, definitely hybrid. If I understand it properly, it is maybe a mixture of PV and wind. There are some, some uh, research ongoing on that. If we can mix if not only like pure PV or pure wind, you can mix two technologies together. Like in one area, you have two technologies. What's going to happen? So you decrease the probability. So only about the probability. Let's say, uh, the probability of you having low energy from the sun and low wind energy is going to be low. It's going to be so the poor probability is 0 0.00 something, but it's going to increase your chances of getting at least maybe a, con a consistent power from the from the uh, renewable energy that you have. It is, but it is still you are still working with hope. It's still working with uncertainties, but it is a an approach it has been proven the, the results are, are, are quite good okay when you have a mix okay so you're not putting all the eggs in one basket you are trying to balance your risk in terms of availability of power so this can this can be an option as well some very good questions thank you for that okay i don't see any more questions maybe we can close here maybe you're going to close the session. Uh, thank you so much for your time, sir. And at this point, I think we should wrap up the session. Thank you all for joining. Take care. Love us. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.